Okay, hello friends. I'm super excited today because today again, we have one more Nugler with us uh, joining all the way from San Francisco, United States. So yeah, uh, we are creating a super man armies over there. I think people heard about it. So don't worry friends, uh, we will uh, break all those myths about uh, super humans who are working at Google. And this is our small attempt to uh, give you insight about uh, Google, how the Google work and the people out there. Uh, this is our second session. In the first session, we have uh, done a similar kind of session with the Karthik. He's also working as a technical uh, manager out there. If you have not seen that video, I will put the link in the description. You can always go and check. That was a really a eye opener session for us. But today guest is Yarun with us. So he is a architect group manager working at Google Cloud, having close to 20 years of total IT experience. So welcome Yarun and thanks for giving your time. How are you today? Pretty good, pretty good. It's great to be here <laughs> and thanks for inviting me, Sanand. Thanks, Yarun. So friends, it's uh, pretty late over there. Uh, I think it's around 11 or 12 in the night when we are shooting this session states and over here in Netherlands is pretty early for me also, but then that's that's what we are here to help you guys. So Yarun, uh, why don't you tell us about your experience, your journey so far? And, and first of all, appreciate uh, having the opportunity to speak to everybody here. Um, so a little bit about me, I uh, started my career about 20 plus years ago um, as a software engineer right, right off school. Uh, I went to school for computer science, went fresh out of it, started uh, doing some roles around software engineering, some backend engineering, then went into engineering management positions. Um, I really wanted to experience different aspects of the software world. So I really tried doing different roles throughout my career. So after you know, being as an engineering manager for a few years, I then ventured into consulting for a few years, working closely with, with uh, clients. Um, after that, I even ventured into product management for about a year, wanted to get a, a touch about what exactly is happening on the product world or on the product side as well. So did a year as a leading a product management function in a startup company that, that didn't work out very well. But right after that, I started my journey as an architect. So the first, first role as a chief architect was with Visa. I think everybody knows Visa. There's no, no need to, to uh, explain what exactly is Visa doing. Um, been with Visa for about four years, in the revenue systems um, area as a chief architect, helped architect uh, essentially the revenue systems that are processing 800 million plus transactions a day. So really a, a huge challenge there. Um, and after that, you know, I, I decided to stay in the financial services vertical and I moved over to Silicon Valley Bank uh, back in 2016. Uh, been a chief architect and leading the, the whole architecture organization. They're actually building that function from scratch, uh, literally being, you know, a, a single person. And when I left, we were a team of 28 architects. So that was a pretty remarkable journey. And I decided to, to kind of try and take a completely different approach, not in financial services. So back in December of last year, uh, I had an opportunity to actually join Google, uh, the Google Cloud area. And I am a architecture program group manager in the Google Cloud business platform area, which essentially is the area that all the business platforms that empower, that powers and enables Google Cloud in the backend, all the way from managing client and customers, orders, billing, marketing, financials, um, the, the onboarding of clients, all of that A to Z is all within the domain that I'm in. So super excited, um, enjoying every day there and um, happy to, to speak a little bit about my journey. Great, great. So let's start with the, your day looks like. So can you just explain what is your role and responsibility as a group manager? What a group manager in Google do? You know, I mean, since morning, by the time you will check out, or if you, you want to share some of the your weekly or monthly events, that will be also great. 
Absolutely. And, you know, as a group manager, obviously I have direct reports that I'm working with my team members. Uh, so it is all about working with my team members on an ongoing basis. Uh, you always want to stay connected and close. But I think what is really important with Google is as a manager, your role is really not to micromanage and not to closely manage folks because we are, in Google are hiring you know, I, I want to say the most or the smartest, most capable talent that, that's available out there. And because of that, a lot of the folks that we're hiring don't need micromanagement, don't need close guidance. As a manager, your role is actually there in order to help them kind of go in the right direction. So guidance through that, remove obstacles. Exactly, exactly. Remove obstacles and, and big rocks out of their way so they will be effective, they will be successful. Make sure you, you kind of build the kind of lay of the land, but let them walk the, the road themselves. So it is very important as, as a manager in Google or somebody that manages direct to stay connected, but give individuals the, the needed freedom in order to really nurture the culture that we have there, which is a culture of uh, individuals are empowered to actually go and make a change, are empowered to go and start projects if they feel that there are areas that needs handling or that needs attention. If they feel that there are um, innovative solutions they want to work on, they are very much encouraged. So it is all about, um, as I said, giving some directions, but really giving them the freedom. So keeping that balance. Now, the, the way we do that in, in Google in terms of the ongoing cadence, right? We were talking about ongoing cadence. It's very much similar to, to other companies as well. So we have our one-on-ones check-ins, we have team meetings, uh, we meet as needed per, you know, per the needed efforts. Each effort is, is a use case of its own. So it really depends. Uh, there's no uh, a fast, a fast uh, rule that you have to follow it. There's no one size fits all. Um, a day in a life is, you know, we're, we're trying to go through meetings, but really not fill your day with meetings. So focus time is really important in Google because, you know, research, researchers and, and uh, studies had found that if you don't set aside time as a focus time and you're just in the mundane of going meeting after meeting after meeting, a lot of that innovation horsepower is getting lost. A lot of the ability to think through what is the best way to do uh, or to go with, with specific solutions or how's the best way to actually solve problems is kind of gonna get lost and, and you know fall between the cracks of your day-to-day -day routines. So really focus time is super important. Uh, we, we are making sure our calendars are blocked with focus time that is dedicated towards thinking about solutions, problems, and what's the best way to solve them. So that's, that's number one. Another really important thing with Google is the uh, encouragement to continue and learn, continue to develop. And this is done via a very rich library of classes, courses, training, articles, uh, discussions with experts in Google, so you are, as an individual and as, and as a manager, you are very encouraged to continuously evolve, develop, understand, and learn. Not only areas that you're an expert in, but also areas that you don't know nothing about, or you know just, you know, we have a superficial knowledge about. Because we do believe that the more you understand about different areas, if you're, you know, the, the right level of talent, which I believe, you know, many Googlers are, you will find ways on how to contribute and how to then take that knowledge that you acquire and make that into, you know, a world-class solution. For example, let's say that you're working on, on a billing system, right? On a, on a revenue system. And you might think this is really simple or, or something that is very, very much routine, right? Well, what is there that, that's so innovative and, and so important or so, so uh, novel about coming up with bidding solutions? But if you understand how to start thinking about AI and ML concepts 
And how can you start introducing those artificial intelligence? How can you start thinking about patterns? How can you start thinking about providing, for example, to users um, what might be the best plan for them if they want to use cloud services? Should they go with, you know, a you can eat model versus should they use just separate services based on patterns, based on historical views or historical users that used to use the same uh, services? You bring in a lot of that suggestions and recommendations right up front to the users. So you take that concept of AML that you might not even have thought about, you know, that it could be helpful. You combine it with those domains and areas which some folks might say, you know, it, it's kind of table stakes or, or maybe it's not, you know, a little boring. And you really make something um, useful and exciting for customers to be able to, to kind of better their day-to-day -day experience. So that's the, that, that education, right? Always, there's always classes, always opportunities to educate and, and to get uh, smarter and better. Um, that's, that's a few things that, that are, you know, I've, I found the Google culture to really be special about. These special, these, these areas are really important. So um, that, that's, that's uh, you know, a couple of things to, to bring up. So you mentioned about, uh... In a way, people management that unmute. Oh, there we go. Yeah, I can hear so, you. So, so, so you uh, talked about uh, people manager uh, trainings and innovation things over there, right? So, but then, and you talked about a lot of trainings and and all those stuff out there, which you are normally doing. Uh, could you also touch base a little bit on the architectural part? Like, is it your uh, responsibilities all also involve some technical stuff or some some programming or you know some some designing which you guys are doing as as an individual because the architecture is there in your in your profile. So, and, and that, the reason I love that question is it's not straightforward when you ask somebody what exactly an architect does. And architects in in Google are a fairly new role. And I've been asked that question, you know, in in many occasions, and I think it it's really worth providing more of a clarity around that. So thank you for asking that question. Architects really sit in between different functions. And what do I mean by that? Architects sit between functions such as product management, software engineers, business groups, uh, and business users, process managers. They take all of those different points of view and they help create solutions that encompass all these points of view. There is always a, a, a tension, right? A healthy tension between product management and software engineers. Product management and software engineers will see priorities in a little bit of a different light. They will think that, you know, um, that is the most important thing to this group versus a different perspective that is a different important thing to a different group. Software engineer might say, I want to now invest 70% of my time building software foundations. I'll work on the logging, I'll work on the monitoring, I'll work on uh, sharding, I'll work on creating you know, a much faster uh, release management uh, pipe. Product management might say, you know what? Don't worry about any of that. All I want you to do is just create these five features or these seven features because that's the most important thing for me. And if in the back end you need to kind of stitch it with bubble gum and, and tape, do that. That is a, not an easy conflict uh, to, to kind of settle, right? And architects can really help with, with that kind of understanding where the balance is, what's the right balance. Architects can understand what is the right way to create roadmaps in a phased approach. Let's say the product manager is gonna say, well, you know what? We actually need this end state um, contract lifecycle management system. Best in breed. I got 75 different features I need in it. You as an architect will now take the engineering side of the house, understand what is available on the ground in terms of software capabilities or services or any tools that we're using. 
and then build a roadmap that might say, okay, we're gonna do those 75 features, but it's gonna take three years and that's how we're gonna build it gradually. So we first you know, build foundations, we'll invest 30% in building those monitoring and you know, the CICD pipeline, et cetera. Then you build on top of that 10 to 12 features every quarter, then you stop for a while, then you run it against some, some test group, et cetera, et cetera. So coming up with those roadmaps is super important. Um, that's why architects in many cases are not only technical folks and are not business me's. They are somewhere in the middle and they're able to then dissect all these different data points into something that can help everybody move forward. We're not writing code specifically, although we are all technical, we wrote code in the past, we can read code um, and we do read code. But the main value that we bring to the table is understanding on complex solutions, how do you wanna build them? Let's say a solution requires integrations and you, know, you need six or seven or eight components to work together. There's a database or a set of databases. There might be even an MDM somewhere in the middle. There's a web application, there's different services. Who does what? What, are the, what is the RACI? What are the boundaries? How is the integration working? All of that keeping in mind about the other non-functional areas, security, privacy, reliability. Making sure all of that is, is kind of, uh, you know, taking place in the right time, in the right place. Putting together a solution. That's, that's one thing of what we're doing. That's the solution architecture. We also do what some uh, companies would refer to as enterprise architecture. What is enterprise architecture? Enterprise architecture can be misinterpreted as, oh, you guys are just sitting somewhere in your ivory tower thinking about those novel ideas that nobody can adopt and not, not much value there. It's quite the opposite in Google. And the way we think about it is that we build tools, we build repos, we build um, frameworks for engineers and product managers to work better with. For example, we'll build a microservices catalog. We'll build an API catalog where everybody can see all the microservices that are available for individuals, teams to work with. So then you don't need to recreate the wheel again, 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 every time you wanna develop um, a service that does X, Y, or Z. We're gonna build asset management tools. So everybody knows exactly what is in our disposal, all the different tools and what are their technical characteristics. Um, we'll build frameworks and guidelines around security and privacy. So if you're an engineer and you're starting thinking about building a solution, do you, what, what, what would you use for, for SSO? What would you use for, um, you know, for, for doing a CICD pipeline? What would you use for data encryption at rest or data encryption in motion? Um, how would you wanna do API security? All those things and the tools and frameworks that we're building are really there to help product managers and engineers, you know, have a, an easier, faster life in when building and, and selecting technologies. So I hope that that was a, a thorough answer. Really great, uh, Aaron. Thanks for explaining that. And this is what we are looking out for from you guys, you know, uh, because then it will be easy for other people who are watching this uh, session to understand the nuisances, uh, what is uh, all these concepts which you mentioned about, right? So that's really uh, nice of you, Aaron. Okay, so can we move on to our next question? Absolutely. Okay, uh, this is, uh, I think, a most commonly thing which all the architects face. So uh, if you can share some of your real life challenges as an architect, uh, and then what approach you guys have taken to resolve those things, you know? I'm sure like uh, with so much uh, interaction, with so much, uh, going things going around you, right? You might have faced your your daily life is a challenge, I know. But then, if you have to come out with one or two biggest challenges, you know, uh, because maybe the due to the risk associated with them, due to the scale associated with those challenges, you know, so that will be really uh, good to know, Yaron. Absolutely, and and I think with Google, it's really interesting because 
I started my career in Google after I worked for a relatively small commercial bank. When I'm saying relatively small, it means you know users in the tens of thousands, not in in you know the hundreds and millions and billions like Google has. Uh, Visa, on the other hand, had a similar uh, you know kind of characteristics to to the Google uh, side of the house, right? So millions and millions, really large distributed systems. Um, when you think about creating solutions for this type of, of a, a crowd, there is always a chain of thoughts about how can you create solutions that are scalable, solutions that are performant, solutions where every millisecond of latency means a lot. Solution where if you are not taking into account aspects such as uh, product inclusion, as an example, you will miss a large population of you know the individuals that you're trying to target towards. What is product inclusion? Let, let's let's keep dive into that. Product inclusion actually means that when you build features for a product, and when you when you're thinking about how to implement them, you want to make sure that these features can be used by a large, broad variety of users. That means that these features needs to be used by folks, you know, that, that have different medical conditions, folks that might have uh, different languages, folks that might have different understanding of technology. So when you think about how do you design a solution that is very focused towards a cohort of users, and let's say it's a relatively small cohort of users, let's say you're creating a financial product in SVB, you know that your crowd is you know, 30,000 uh, individuals that are high net worth, as an example. Very, very you know, secluded, very, very uh, framed. In Google, you're aiming a very large population of users. So features have to cater for many other use cases many more use cases when you think about creating features. That means you really have to think through uh, on the different angles of these features. Make sure that when you deploy them, you are testing it thoroughly, you're designing it with a thought towards the different population of users that are gonna use them. You probably heard about the Pixel latest uh, phone model that just came out where what they did is they did a special enhancements for, for individuals with darker skin. So when they take pictures now, there is an auto correction that the camera itself is doing. There's an AI process that runs in the background that does auto correction. So the, the pictures themselves will come in in an optimal resolution, similar to how you take pictures of individuals with a lighter skin. So that, that is you know, a really, really good example of how you kind of think about features that are inclusive, that touches upon many, many, many different types of users and not something more secluded and more framed. That's, that's really different with Google. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot, Diego. Okay, so now this is the, the question which most of the people want to know. How can anyone join Google? The what is your experience? Question, right? <laughs> million dollar question. How anyone can uh, join uh, uh, Google and part of Superhumans? Well, you know, we, we spoke just before the, this meeting, but we're, we are a very, very normal group of individuals. I can assure you that uh, the individuals that are getting accepted to Google are going through a multi-layer, multi-dimensional interview. And there is a lot of weightage to not only how good you are in coding or how good you are in system design or how good you are in integrations, et cetera, et cetera. There are other elements that are always being evaluated as their own interviews. So that means that let's say you're, you're you know, the best coder out there or you're really good at system design, but your leadership skills, and when I'm saying leadership, it doesn't necessarily have to be people management. 
you have to be able to lead as an IC, as an individual contributor. You have to, to have that set of minds to lead. If you see a problem, you cannot sit behind and wait for somebody else to solve. You have to jump on it. You have to kind of start investing the time and effort to, to you know, resolve some of these issues. Um, that, that's kind of the, the leadership side of the, the interview. Googliness is, and you probably heard about Googliness. Googliness is that amorphic uh, characteristics of what we're looking for in terms of culture here in Google. And there's, there's a million YouTube clips out there that are attempting to explain what Googliness is, but you know, it, it's hard to, to, uh, to go and really put your finger on specific questions or specific answers that you need to provide to questions around what Googliness is. I would summarize it by saying there is definitely a no jerks policy in Google. So we're, we're essentially looking to see whether you're a great team member, whether you're somebody that is very collaborative, whether you're somebody that you might be collaborative, but still when it's time to stand on your own, you're gonna stand on your own. Um, we're, we're looking to see that you're somebody that cares about others, especially if you're in a leadership role. Empathy is really important and the ability to, to demonstrate empathy, really, really important. So we're trying to be, or to instill kind of a one big family. And I know there's 157,000 people in Google, I think, uh, last I heard. It's hard to have that, that's, that large of a family, but the feeling is, you know, kind of the same Google culture across the board. And that's what really brings together all these different areas and different domains and you know many many different teams in, in Google is that Googliness culture. Um, back to the question of how did I get into Google, right? It was not a slam dunk. I actually went through uh, two processes. The first one didn't work out because of various reasons. It was for a completely different role a few years ago. Um, the important thing to understand is if you tried to get into Google with one process and it didn't work out, do not give up. It doesn't mean that from that point onwards, you don't have the opportunity to join. It's the vice versa of it. So opportunities in Google, because there's so many and, and the organization is so large, might come from different organizations. And that's what happened with me. So the first time, you know, I went through the entire interview process, eventually it didn't work out. That happened probably three or four years ago. And I just let it go and things continued their course. And after, you know, three years plus, I got another phone call from a recruiter, different recruiter from a different organization. And he said, you know, we have your, your uh, resume in the system. We took a look at it. We think you might be a good fit for this role, a completely different role. We started this process, completely different set of interviewers. It's a different product area. It's a different role, different seniority, different level. Everything, you know, clean slate, essentially. Went through this interview process and you know what? This time it was a best match and, and it just clicked. And it just worked out both for me personally and for Google. So it's about finding the right fit and the right match. And I think what Google is really good at, if it doesn't feel like it's a match from both places, it's probably not going to happen. Meaning even if it's, if it's a role that you're saying, you know what, it's not, not the role of my dreams. Maybe the level is not the level you want it to be at. Maybe the domains of interest aren't aren't the, the right domains of interest. But you know, it's Google, right? So I'll just put my head down and just go in and do things that I'm not really excited about. Doesn't work. There's gonna be somebody during the interview process likely that is going to detect that and things you know, are, are not gonna work out because we want both sides to have that perfect match. We want you to feel that it's exactly what you want to do. And then for Google, of course, for, for this to be a better, good fit for Google. So this will happen with my current interview process. Uh, it took a while. Processes in Google do take a few months, like um, 
in, in many cases. You go through a, a set of interviews. I have to say most of these interactions are uh, really interesting because again, you speak with really interesting individuals during those interviews and go through you know, a set of interesting use cases. And it, it just uh, clicked. And this time, you know, we went through uh, all the phases. There's a hiring committee uh, phase there at the end and it worked. So there we go, here I am. Thanks, uh, thanks a lot. Uh, just to uh, dig out a little bit more on a interviewing part, right? So I heard from uh, Karthik that for him, uh, he just applied via LinkedIn and then he got a recruiter call. And then it's, as you mentioned, it's like four, three, four interviews has taken during, I think two, three months time duration. This is what he mentioned. So is it for you also, as you already mentioned that uh, this is your second time and your resume is already there in the Google database, right? And they call you after a couple of years. So do you advise uh, people to look out for job in Google platform and apply them at least upload their resumes and, uh, and then just to, uh, hope for that they will get a call from recruiter or you will also advise to people to, to approach. For example, you are working on Google, someone like you, right? So do you think that I can also approach you as a referral and uh, then maybe the probability of getting the call is more or what do you suggest? Great question. So, so the, the route of just uploading your resume can, can work. It's not that it doesn't work, it can work. The more effective route is going through somebody who works in Google. But uh, there is a process when you do that in which the referral is being asked essentially, how good does he know you? Okay. It's okay to refer individuals. And I can say, you know, I'm right now referring to none, but if I don't know you well, it's not gonna be that, that much of a difference in other words. It's mm -hmm. not going to put your, your application on steroids. It's going to be different if I really know you well. Then it carries substantial or more substantial weight or weightage. But if just a, 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 what we call kind of a, a you know, a, a cold referral, what it's happened? okay. It's, it's, it's a route, but it's not very strong in terms of, of the weightage that it carries. Okay. So that's so, that's how it works. So I think it's a good thing because uh, most of the time when we refer someone, right? Uh, mostly when I refer, I know them personally, but then I've also seen people who are just randomly referring people, right? So I think in that in that case, maybe you will also uh, put something about that particular guy that okay, I know him by this and this thing and something like that, some some story, something like that, right? Or exactly. Something. Exactly. We, we go through, through a process, it's, it's digitized. You have to kind of answer a few, mm -hmm. a few more, more uh, you know, close questions. And, um, and that mm -hmm. kind of gives an understanding how good you actually know the person. Mm -hmm. Referrals yeah. is always a very, very effective way to bring talent to companies. But the question is how intimate are you actually familiar with those mm -hmm. uh, referrals? Because that's, that's where the, the real uh, secret is. No, that's great to know that that's good to know because you know sometimes what happened that after watching these videos or randomly also just people just send the request that okay i'm looking for a job and after this video also you will get a lot of requests here okay so <laughs> be ready for that normally it happens people will reach out to you on linkedin so yeah i mean that's okay because everyone try to be there right in in google so i think that's okay you have to be at that thing uh, other interesting thing you talked about uh, case studies during your uh, interview intakes, right? So I don't want to uh, ask you anything from your actual interview, but then I'm going to give you a, one a small case study. And uh, I would like to see your thought on that, like how you are going to tackle that. <laughs> are you ready? Sure. We'll, we'll simulate the Google interview. Yes. <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, now think about this Netflix, right? So how you're going to scale Netflix platform, uh, especially during the uh, vacation series, uh, during especially on the weekends or uh, during, uh, let's say Christmas holidays are coming and suddenly people are you know, watching a lot of TVs because weather is not that great and people are inside. So how you're going to scale their platform due to, due to this increased demand? So that's the question. When, 
No, it's a, it's a great question. And, you know, platforms at the scale of Netflix, which I think last time I read the, the traffic that is being created by Netflix users, it's something crazy. It was 30 something percent out of the entire traffic on the internet, North America. There is, it's just it, a humongous. It, so it is, it is a, a massive infrastructure behind the scenes on how you make sure that you provide the right bandwidth. And as you said, as things flex up and down, um, how do you create that level of elasticity? And by the way, this is a great design question uh, for an interview. So the, the way I would answer it is, and that not to say that I've had that on my Google interviews, but the, the way I would answer it is I would look for a piece of infrastructure that can provide that elasticity. And the, the immediate thing that comes into mind when you think about architecture that can facilitate that type of an elasticity is going into a container architecture. And with containers, that's where you have a solution that you can actually spawn up instances or processes as per the demand. And you can spin up and you can bring them down as per the demand. And of course, there is now uh, the whole container industry had gone through a big revolution the last few years. The containers solution had been really uh, developing at a rapid pace. Um, as they were kind of developing in scale, they always had some issues around security. But those areas are also now being covered and, and kind of remediated. So that solution is now becoming more and more uh, secure with enterprise security, enterprise grade security for containers and services. Of course, the scalability features were always there. And together it really brings a, a solution that is a great platform for you to work on. When you think about creating an, elast an elastic service in mind, there's two types of containers, largely speaking. There's the si simple containers and then the, the, the orchestrated solutions for containers. So it all depends on how complex is your use case and how big of a scale you need to get to. In the Netflix use case, for example, that definitely needs a orchestrated container solution, which could be, for example, OpenShift, or it can be GKE if you work on, on uh, Google Cloud. You need a, a container that is orchestrated, that can run multiple processes, that can essentially manage large portions in different regions uh, in a distributed way. So going into that more complex ecosystem is really a must for that type of a use case. So that, that would be, I would base my answer around, around that type of an infrastructure. If, if you can kind of sense how I answer that, just to give folks some tips, if they run into such a, a question on an interview, you have to kind of, look at the problem, you have to analyze the problem, you have to ask questions if you're not sure. You have to essentially then come up with different options and explain your thought process. Why not go with a simple container? Why do you wanna go with an orchestrated container? Um, tell me a little bit about reasons or why you decided to go with that container. With Google, it's really important to keep it fairly technical when you're in the engineering family, which I am part of. So architects are part of engineering organization. So I know you asked me that question early in, in our conversation here. Being technical is really important, but you don't need to be a software engineer and don't need to go into coding level when you are answering questions on, on, a, on an architecture interview, as an example. You have to kind of find the balance in between. So Answers, for example, if I would answer to your question, you know what, we just need some sort of an infrastructure that can scale up and down. We'll, we'll do it on some sort of an infrastructure. That doesn't work. What works is what type of infrastructure is that? And show me some industry examples and explain a little bit more about how processes are spun up and down and explain how distribution is going to work across regions. That's where that richness of knowledge and understanding of the problem really shines. So that's that's kind of how you need to think when you when you come to a 
more of a technical interview in Google. Thanks a lot, Yaron. I have one last question for you for this session. And uh, yeah, I mean, I'm, I know I'm taking your time, but then I'm not able to stop myself, honestly. You know, the way you are answering and giving- Conversation is great. Is really mesmerizing, honestly, to, to hear you, to see you. Okay, so this is the last one for today. Uh, because I think this question is again very important. Uh, right now we talked about GDPR, we talked about uh, personal information stuff out there in Facebook, in Google, and in a lot of places, right? So I just want to ask you, like, how do you ensure the security of uh, data in transit and data at rest? Like, um, if you can just give some examples or the ways by which, uh, you know, uh, we can provide the security protocols uh, with respect to data. And it's not a specific to Google I mean, in general, like, I mean, let's say if I have to design anything. So how I ensure that uh, the data, which is because a lot of users are trusting us, it can be, I mean, all the businesses have a lot of, uh, whether it's bank or it can be any apps or any website, this and that. So what are the different security protocols which will going to help us? I think when you think about uh, security and privacy, and a lot of times they kind of uh, go hand in hand, um, there's different aspects to always consider. So when we think about security, and when you think about the ability to secure information, both at rest and at motion, and there's different security risks that are spinning out of it. Why is that? Because data at rest is going to be inherently a little bit more secure than data in motion. Why? Because you can apply another level of access management on top of data at rest. So you, you always have that, that ability to, to kind of guard it a little better. And therefore you, you would invest enough effort and, and you know, um, the CPU and computing time in, in making sure that, that data in motion is going to be really safeguarded. And data in motion, the idea is to always have it end to end. So it's not enough just to do data in motion encryption for portions of your data journey. You have to really make sure that end to end, the data is always secured. There's different techniques and ways to do that. A couple of examples that we put out there. When, for example, when I, as, as a company, as an enterprise, I want to connect to a third party SaaS application, Let's say I want to connect to a Salesforce instance or a Workday instance and really transfer sensitive data. I sometimes want to create what we call a VPN tunnel, which is a secured pipe that is not visible and cannot be compromised by the outside world. Um, that, that's one way. The other way is if you work through APIs or if you create interfaces, always use SSLs, always use HTTPS, and always make sure that you use the latest security protocols such as TLS 1.3, as an example. So you have to kind of make sure that all these portions bidirectionally are well secured. If there's a response back, if there's, uh, you know, parts of your journey that are not secured, this is inherently a vulnerability. So you wanna make sure your entire journey is secured. What we typically also do is we don't just look at portions of that network between your data center and outside your data center, but also within your data center. You wanna make sure that you continue and apply data in motion encryption as data is being transformed between different network layers in your organization. So that's, that's one thing. We spoke a little bit more about, um, about data at rest and encrypting data at rest and the, the fact that access controls can give you that additional layer. But when you apply algorithms for data at rest encryption, again, use the latest industry standards such as AES-256 to make sure that the data is indeed adequately encrypted with the right strength of encryption. Make sure that when you encrypt data, you don't do it only on production data, but also on test environments. Why? Because data from test environments can leak. 
data from text in web test environment can be, uh, you know, can make its way, if non encrypted, into different uh, destinations that, you know, are, are not so friendly. So you want to make sure you, you kind of go across environments when you apply data addressed encryption. Um, some database have what we call native encryption. Oracle, as an example, has native encryption that you can turn on, but it is not true for all the different types of databases. And sometimes you want to add in another layer of encryption on top of that. So you have a holistic solution across the board, like Thales is a good, a good example for a vendor that does that encryption layer across the board for data at rest and is agnostic for databases. So there's, you know, as, as with any uh, technical solutions, there's different ways to solve for it. It's a question of how much you want to invest, how your technical ecosystem looks like, how your network topology looks like, and kind of take all of that into account when you think through that. But definitely a really important question. Security is really, really, really important in Google, really important financial institutes like Visa and SVB. Um, these institutes are really taking that really seriously. That's, that's about security. Privacy is a different question. Privacy is when you bring in, for example, GDPR or CCPA, which is the California Consumer Protection Act. There's others across the world also that are popping up. There's one in Brazil, there's, there's one in India, there's different uh, privacy policies. What's kind of the common for all of these is the user's right to demand to have their private information and also demand to delete and remove that information permanently. They also wanna have adequate controls around um, the ability to unsubscribe from promotions or emails or marketing materials all of that uh, different uh, elements. And we wanna make sure that when we're deleting data, what we call data retention, it is done as per a very prescribed schedule. Um, being a, not being able to meet any of these can result in fines up to billions of dollars that by the way, had been already paid by different institutes like Facebook because they couldn't do that because they weren't consistent, because they didn't kind of think about all of these concepts. So in, in Google, it is taken very seriously and there's you know, tremendous efforts to make sure that all of those privacy tenants are being implemented across our solutions and across our stack. Um, that means not only for data that our users are storing in Google or processing through Google systems, but also for Googlers that are using and processing data through those systems. So I hope that that was a yeah, kind of a thorough answer. Incredible, uh, you're an incredible, I, I can say. The way you've explained uh, with this great example, it's it really shows your your vast knowledge. So I'm really, really thankful that, uh, you know, uh, you are came here and shared all your wisdom with all of us. So I know Yaron, it's, it's quite late over there. I really wish to have a lot of other questions in my, you know, in my bucket, but then maybe some other time, Yaron. So uh, thanks a lot one more time. And friends, if you are watching this session, I can say that uh, this one hour session is more than doing one year of MBA friends. Uh, the, kind, uh, the kind of this gentleman over here, the way he has explained the things in very easy to understand language. I think that's, the key takeaway for me because I'm not from that technical background in terms of cloud computing and all, but then the way he explained, I can also understand. So then I think anyone can understand. And I think that's make you different, Yarun. Uh, you when I say you means Googler, the way you guys explain, uh, that's the same experience I have last time with, with Karthik as well. He's also very down to earth. And you know, the way you explain, it, it shows that, you know, that the kind of people which you guys are having in, in your ecosystem, I think that's makes a Google different, you know, that's, that's I think the USP of Google. So thanks one more time, Yarun, for all your time and efforts you have taken. And uh, I hope that this is not going to be over one and only session. Definitely I'll uh, bug you a lot in future as well. 
as and when you have time please do come and share your wisdom with all of us yeron thanks a lot the pleasure and thanks again for the opportunity sunan you guys have a great day